as part of our birding series, we feel um, that many of us would like to know more about how, can, how we can attract the widest range of beautiful birds into our gardens and how we can make sure that we don't get um, birds that are not so desirable in our gardens. Living in Darien, we're fortunate enough to have Joe Warren of Wild Birds Unlimited with us today to give us some useful advice and tips. So welcome, Joe. Thank you. Uh, okay. get, getting started with bird watching and, and feeding birds in your own yard is actually can be very simple. Um, a small bird feeder with a, a, some seed in it will do just fine. It, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate. You can start out. Uh, you, there are things you can get in any uh, store that will that you can simply hang from a tree branch. You don't even need a feeder. You, you know, in, in my own store, we carry a, a, a bell that's made of solid bird seed and it has a tie on the top of it. You hang it from a branch and watch the birds come. Having said that, th that sounds very simple. And in fact, it is. Um, the bigger question is, what do I want to come? What can I expect to come? And what do I not want to come? Number one issue in any backyard here in Darien, Connecticut, or anywhere in the Fairfield County area is uh, if you put anything that remotely resembles bird seed in your yard, not only will you attract birds, but you will attract squirrels. And for most people, we really don't want the squirrels coming to eat our bird food. Uh, there are ways to stop that, and, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, the, the, so, the, so, so let's let's take it from there. So saying that, Joe, what can we expect to see in our garden at this time of year? It, it, it's, that was going to be my next thing. Is what do we want to come to our bird feeders? Well, first of all, uh, we'd like the colorful birds. We'd like to see cardinals, that beautiful bright red color. Um, we would like to see uh, things like the uh, the red-bellied woodpecker, which has a gorgeous red head on it. Uh, we'd love to see coming back to the area, the Baltimore Oriole, which is a beautiful, the, the male is a bright orange, the female a bright yellow. We'd like to see goldfinches, which in the summertime, again, a bright yellow color in, in our garden. The black capped chickadee, the contrast between the black skull cap on its head and the white breast uh, makes for a pretty bird to see uh, in, in our gardens. And all of those are, are common, and they will come. Uh, the, not the Oriole, not so much anymore, uh, although they are making a comeback in the area. But back in the dark ages, when I was a kid, we used to see Baltimore Orioles all over the place uh, as the habitat went away, the habitat being the large canopy-type trees like a hickory or a sycamore, not an oak or a maple. Uh, we're, we're perfect for the, scar or for the uh, Scarlet Tanager and the uh, Baltimore Oriole. At the end of the Second World War, we started building houses and we cut down those habitat trees and the birds just went away. They went look for a place where those trees existed. Now here we are almost 100 years later and the trees we planted back in the late 40s, early 50s have begun to mature and the habitat has been restored. And so we're beginning to see these beautiful, colorful birds come back into the area. But on a normal day, put a bird feeder in your yard, you will see the tufted titmouse, the black-capped chickadee, the house wren, the, uh, 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 the, the uh, cardinals. You'll see the cardinals. Let's talk about cardinals. Everybody wants cardinals to come to their bird feeder. Not so much. Uh, cardinals are what we consider a ground feeder. You are much more likely to see a cardinal on the ground underneath your feeder eating the seed that falls on the ground than you are to actually see the cardinal up on the feeder. Why? What can I do to get that cardinal to come up onto the feeder where I can see it? Most bird feeders, simple, simplistic bird feeders, have a small single perch. It's like a little pole that sticks out from the side. The smaller birds can sit on that, turn their head sideways, and eat. The cardinal does not want to turn its head sideways. It wants to sit and peck like a chicken. Therefore, they're much more comfortable on the ground. 
So if we're gonna get them to come up to the bird feeder, we have to put in a feeder that either has a platform that they could sit on the edge of and peck like a chicken, or has a wide perch that they can sit out on the end of and peck like a chicken. Otherwise, we have to be content to see them on the ground underneath the feeder. Okay, uh, so following on from that, Joe, where are the best places to put the feeders? Typically, the feeder wants to be somewhere in the yard uh, where it's visible. Uh, birds have no sense of smell, so they find their food by line of sight. If you take your bird feeder and bury it under the overhang of a porch or bury it deep in the, the branch of a tree, the likelihood that a bird is going to find it right away is pretty slim. So you want to put it where it's visible. The next thing you want to look for is what's in the area of the bird feeder. You don't want to stick the bird feeder out in the middle of the yard where there's nothing around it. Birds want to know that they're in the middle of feeding and they have a sense that a predator, a hawk, um, uh, an owl, something that's going to come and disturb a cat, they want to know that they can dive into the shrubbery that's in the area of the bird feeder and find protection. Uh, the kinds of shrubbery they're looking for, a privet hedge works well. Birds can bury themselves inside the privet hedge and the large predator birds can't get in there. Um, for Scythia, because it grows with so many branches so close together, the birds, again, can the smaller birds can get in there and stay safe uh, away from the predators. So we want to locate our bird feeders somewhere on the property where it's visible as birds are flying by, but it's close to somewhere that they can, you know, 15, 20 feet away, where if they feel threatened, they can immediately dive in and look for cover. Uh, that that's the habitat that will work best. So so that's for feeders. What what would we do for nesting? Do you have any suggestions on where to hang your nests? First thing you need to understand is there are only a few birds in this area that actually build a nest in a bird house. Uh, most birds want to build their nest outdoors. Um, the the robin builds its nest in a shrub, a small bush, a little evergreen. Uh, the, uh, the, the house wren uh, and the house finch both want to go inside a cavity. They want to have a house with a hole in it. They want to go inside and put their nest inside of there. So we can put up a house. Uh, we can put it on a pole or we can hang it from a tree branch. Again, somewhere where it will be visible. So as they're flying around looking for a space to nest in, they will see it. Or we can grow in our in our yards and in our gardens, uh, small, low shrubbery, like uh, an evergreen, a yew, or something like that, that will be compatible with these birds building their nest. Let me talk, for, as long as we're on the subject of nest, let me talk about the robin. Robins we see around here all the time. They're out in the yard. They don't come to our bird feeder. And the reason they don't come to our bird feeder is because they don't eat bird seed. They eat worms and they want to find those worms out in the grass, in the lawn. They will eat grubs, which is great because most of those grubs destroy our grass. So we want the robins to be out there eating the grubs. But robins have a habit of building their nest in a shrub right next to the front door. Many people have instances where the robin built their nest in an old wreath that was left on the front door. Why? What possesses them? to want to be so close to where I'm walking. Because every time I walk by that nest, they raise a ruckus. They screech and howl and fly down. Well, yeah, they'll do that because they want me to know they're there and they don't really want me to disturb their nest. But they put that nest in a place where they know there's human traffic because they depend on us to keep other predators away from their nest site. We're walking back and forth, therefore there will not be any cats there looking to attack their nest site. We're walking back and forth, there won't be any large predator birds coming down trying to steal the eggs. The likelihood that a raccoon is going to come to that nest during the day when the adult is out looking for food is very minimal when the nest is built in the, in the vicinity of human traffic. And at night, they're not so worried because they're sitting on the eggs. They are in the nest protecting the nest themselves. 
So that's why we see those robin's nests in places that we look at and say, that's an odd place to build a nest, but they use us as their protector to protect that nest site. So that's very interesting. So now can you tell me, is there truth in this comment that if you have a birdhouse, a new bird next season won't use that house until you've cleared it out? Or is that not true? That is not true. It is advisable in the fall to clean out any birdhouse. Take all the old nesting material out. Nature has programmed birds to build a new nest every season. And so they're not afraid of the work. But if you leave the old nest in, songbirds that nest, the, the, the house wren, the most prolific nester in the area, only has a lifespan of about six to eight years. So if we get a, 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 a wren that's nesting in a, in a birdhouse you know, on our property, that same bird will come back year after year, and then it dies. And its offspring will come back to that nesting site. But if they get there in the spring and there's a nest already in the birdhouse, they immediately say, this is occupied. I have to go look somewhere else. So if we take the old nesting material out and clear that box so that in the spring they can start all over fresh, we're much more likely to have the box occupied season after season. The other thing to keep in mind is that while birds do not use a birdhouse to live in all year round the way humans do, they use it to nest. They build their nest, they lay their eggs, they, the young hatch, the young fledge, and that's it. They don't go back in the house until wintertime comes. And now, especially here in New England, when a big nor'easter comes roaring through and the wind is howling and it's bitter cold, most birds in all winter long are perfectly content to roost in an evergreen, someplace that will protect them from the wind. But if that wind picks up and gets too much, they will spend the night in a birdhouse just to be protected from the wind. In the spring when they're nesting, one family to a house, male, female, chicks, that's it. Anybody else tries to invade that house, they will chase them away. Winter time, they will crowd six, eight, ten birds all into a tiny little birdhouse to share the warmth. And we make room for them to do that by clearing out the old nesting material and leaving the space empty for them. To, they're not looking to nest. They're not looking for a place to protect their eggs. They just want a place to get out of the wind. That's so fascinating. Cleaning out that, that old material is a good thing to do. Do it in the fall after we're sure the nesting season is all over and allow them to use that space during the winter. Oh, fantastic. So now can you tell me, talking about these birds moving in the winter, when we talk about migration, do we need to have different, do we need to provide different food in feeders at different times of the year and at different seasons? Do birds rely more on the feeders in winter or... Is there a difference? There can be a difference. It's not a dramatic difference. For the most part, the birds that we buy in a bag, bird seed, are all high fat content. So it gives the birds energy. Sunflower seeds, high fat content. Um, if I ate things like that, my cardiologist would have a conniption. But for the birds, it's great because they burn up that energy as quickly as they eat it. Um, we can change to even higher fat content, things like peanuts, as we get into colder weather because they need more energy to fend off the cold. The spring is a good time to put out high fat content food because the adults are raising the young. Now, let's understand how this happens. The eggs hatch. Now the adults are responsible for, for feeding the young. The young can't eat bird seed. They can't digest it. Their digestive system isn't powerful enough to break it down. So what the adults are doing is going out and catching insects and bringing the insects back to the nest for the young, the nestlings to eat. High protein, uh, high energy, and very little problem digesting it, okay? Uh, so why do we keep the bird feeder out? The birds are eating insects. Well, we keep it out to give the adults energy so they have the energy to go out and hunt down all these insects to bring back to the nest to feed the young. Uh, they'll take whatever assistance we can give them. 
uh, both during the spring and, and as we get later on. Now, most birds, uh, backyard songbirds, will have more than one clutch. They'll lay a, a set of eggs early in the spring. They will hatch. The birds, the chicks will fledge. And within a week, they'll lay another set of eggs and raise a second family. And they'll do this several times during the course of the, of the spring. By the time we get into the end of June, beginning of July, most of that nesting is finished. Um, they don't want to be doing this kind of heavy work in the heat of the summer. They want to do it when it's a little cooler in the spring. So right now, are we expecting our birds, uh, all, all the nesting to be, are the, the birds starting to leave their nests at this the time? The chicks are beginning to fledge. They're all beginning to fly on their own. But this early in June, in all probability, if the first clutch has fledged, a second clutch is being laid and being tended to. I would expect to see nestlings all the way through the end of June. Uh, it's when we start getting into July and August that they go away. Except, there's always an exception, the goldfinch. The goldfinch is the last songbird in this area to nest. They do not nest in a box. They build a nest typically in an area um, along some kind of a waterway where there are reeds and, and weeds that they can build their nest into. But what they're looking for is when they build their nest out of dry grass and hay, just like all the other birds do. But they line their nest with a very soft material. And in the case of the goldfinch, most of the time that material is the down of a thistle. And so they are waiting for the wild thistle to go to seed and produce the down before they build their nest so that they have the right material to line their nest. And so that's why they're the last ones. They've, they've just barely begun to start looking for nesting sites now and they'll nest much later in the summer as the wild thistle begins to bloom and go to seed. So they're particularly fussy. They're going to wait for their luxury. They are. They, they, they want a very particular material to line their nest with and they'll wait until it's there. Oh, that's fascinating. So, so there's another plant I have my, in my garden. It's called a buddleia, the butterfly bush. Yes. Can you tell us how else we can attract hummingbirds? Uh, butterfly bush is a great source of, of attraction for hummingbirds. Um, petunias, hibiscus. Um, look at a hummingbird. Look at the shape of a hummingbird. These are tiny little birds, but they have a very long beak. And in addition, their tongue inside that beak is about as long and half again as more than their beak. So they have the ability to reach way down deep into a trumpet-shaped flower, which is what they do to get nectar. Now, they'll get nectar anywhere they can. If they can get it from a geranium or uh, a flower like that, they will. But in order to get that nectar, they're competing with the bees because the nectar is right out there on the surface. With things like hibiscus and petunia, they're not, the bees have trouble flying into those uh, types of plants and getting back out again. Whereas the hummingbird has no problem at all. It sticks their long tongue down into the bottom and they're fine. So you plant flowers like that. The, the butterfly bush is like that, has tiny flowers, but they're, they go deep. And that's where they can stick their tiny little beak in and get the nectar out of it. Honeysuckle, same thing has that tulip shape to it, and they can reach down into the bottom and, uh, and get the nectar out that they're interested in. So when can we expect to see hummingbirds round? Is it still too soon? No, hummingbirds are here. They're, there is only one species of hummingbird that is native to Connecticut. That is the ruby-throated hummingbird. Occasionally, you will see sightings of the Anna's hummingbird or the rufous-sided hummingbird, but these are birds that got blown off course during migration. The only one that is regularly seen in Connecticut is the ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, there are lots of them. They're all over the place. Uh, they come back. Usually, we, we tell people that the target date is Mother's Day, the first week in May. Um, they come back from way, way down south. They, they spend their winters down in southern uh, Mexico and northern South America. Wow. Uh, and so they, they cover a lot of territory in their migration. Uh, but when they get here, 
that what they are looking for is a place to feed and a place to build a nest. They typically build their nests in an evergreen, 15, 20 feet up in the air, uh, where a branch meets the trunk is where they will build their nest. They use the bark from evergreen trees, the little pieces of bark that break off as material for the nest. They will also use moss as material for the nest. I find it fascinating how they stick all of this together. The robin builds its nest and it uses dry grass and it goes out and finds mud to hold the whole thing together. Um, the hummingbird goes through the forest and finds old spider webs oh, wow. and uses the sticky silk from the old spider webs to hold all the pieces together for its nest, um, which I think is pretty clever. Um, so does the hummingbird, would that, would that re-nest in the same spot every year? They typically will go back to the same place over and over again. Again, keep in mind the life expectancy of these birds is fairly short. So uh, that nest may get taken over by the children of the original pair. Right. Um, and, and it is possible during the winter. These are tiny, tiny little creatures in the nest. The opening, the, the top of a hummingbird nest is about the diameter of a quarter. Wow. So it's a very small little apparatus. Uh, wouldn't take much snow, ice, wind um, to knock this thing off its perch in which case they'll start the whole process all over again in the spring and build a new nest. The reason I bring all this up is because hummingbirds, when they first get here, are looking for a food source and a nesting site. And they will then fly back and forth between the nesting site and the food source uh, to meet their needs until the young have fledged. Once the chicks have left the nest, now the chicks are out looking for new food sources and the adults are also looking for new food sources. And so if you didn't get them when they originally, if you didn't have your hummingbird feeder out the first week in May, last week in April, first week in May, so that they found it when they first came back from the migration, you probably go the whole month of May, most of June without seeing them come to your feeder. And then all of a sudden they're out looking for food sources again and now you have a very good chance of getting uh, birds to come to your, your hummingbird feeder. So I guess the same if you plant your flowers late, you're not going to see them until the flowers are ready for them to. That's, that's correct. That's wow. correct. Wow. Mm. So now, Joe, so can you tell us what got you involved in birding? We've just gone through COVID. We've gone through um, a lot of people are interested in birding. It's a wonderful um, hobby to get out, to be in nature. We're spotting more birds because obviously things are quiet and not because there are more birds. Um, so there's the therapeutics of birding as well as the, the excitement of identifying birding. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in birding? How I got involved is really very simple. I am by trade an, an electronics engineer. I had nothing to do with birds. I spent 34 years working for Pitney Bowes doing uh, electronic development. I worked in their corporate research lab and I worked in their quality assurance department analyzing data. Uh, I got into birding because my wife was looking for a job. Um, she used to work for Golf Digest. Golf Digest got bought out by Condé Nast. She needed to look for something different to do. She went to a seminar about franchises and this franchise showed up on the radar and it looked interesting to both of us. I took early retirement from Pitney Bowes. We bought our first store up in Bedford Hills, New York. Uh, which we have since sold. And 10 years ago, we opened the store here in Darien, Connecticut. And the rest, as they say, is history. Now, what I have found, got into it accidentally, um, did not get into this because I was so passionate about bird watching. What I have found, not only for myself, but for many of my customers, it is not difficult to become, to start to become passionate about bird feeding. Um, I've had examples. I, I had a gentleman two years ago. His wife came into the store at Christmas time and she said after the holidays he was going to be moving into a home office. He was no longer going to be working at his office in the city. He's going to be spending the majority of his time at the house in an office they set up in the house. 
She thought it would be interesting to buy him a bird feeder that she could hang outside the window of his new office. So she bought a bird feeder and a five pound bag of bird seed and that was his part of his Christmas present. And he came back the week after Christmas and said, I don't know what she was thinking. She got me this bird feeder. Now I have to fill it with bird seed. And I ran out of seed. Can I get another bag of bird seed? And I sold him another bag of bird seed. He came back two weeks later with an entirely different attitude. Joe, what, what else can I put back there? What <laughs> other kinds of seed can I, what different birds can I attract to my yard? It, it, it catches on very, very quickly. And you find there are so many fascinating things going out there. And the interaction from one bird species to another, who's fighting over food resources, who's helping each other to gather food resources. Um, and the, in, in, here in Phil County, we are incredibly fortunate because there's such a wide variety of bird species that come through the area. Um, we're, we're virtually every day finding something new and different to look at in, in the area of our bird feeders. So, um, so saying that, we, one thing we didn't touch on was water. So providing water for these birds, do we have birds in the area that don't need so much water in the summer or do we need to provide water? Uh, it's not they don't need the water, they need lots of water, just like humans. They need to stay hydrated. And because of the amount of energy they expend in flying and staying perched and, and putting up with the wind and all the other things, um, they consume tremendous amounts of water. Now, it, it is not as big a deal here in Fairfield County as it might be somewhere else because go outside, look around you. Natural water exists all over. There are ponds and streams and places for birds to get water everywhere we look. And because of that, if we put a bird bath in our yard, um, we're competing with the natural water sources and the birds typically will go to the natural water sources before they come to an artificial water source. So what do we do? We, we put a bird bath out in the yard and we fill it with water and keep our fingers crossed. Well, we can do a little more than that. First of all, if you're gonna maintain a bird bath, you have to make sure that you refresh the water every couple of days. Stagnant water is an invitation for mosquitoes. Mosquitoes will lay their eggs, and next thing you know, you got mosquitoes all over the place. So you need to continually refresh the water. You can also add devices to the bird bath. Uh, we, we have something called a water wiggler, which is just a battery operated device that ripples the water, keeps it moving. And as long as the water is moving, number one, it attracts the birds because they see the ripples. And number two, the mosquitoes won't lay eggs in, in water that's moving. Uh, you can get uh, misters or drippers that you can attach to your garden hose and put over your bird bath. And the drip, drip, drip of the water again will cause ripples and, uh, and attract the birds and keep the mosquitoes away. Bird baths do not, this is not a swimming pool. This is not a spa. We're not trying, the, the, the birds that swim are the waterfowl and they typically are in the large ponds or in the salt water, the ducks, the geese. They're not coming to our bird feeders. The songbirds that come to our bird feeders are not coming there to go swimming. They're coming there to splash a little bit, uh, to preen their feathers, and mostly to drink the water to meet their requirements to stay hydrated. So a bird bath typically wants to be very shallow it should not be any more than two inches deep. You don't want a big bowl, five, six, eight inches of water. Um, they, they're not comfortable. If you find that you, you, you find the perfect bird bath, it's so attractive, I gotta have this in my garden, but it's too deep. Fill it with pebbles, rocks, small stones to raise the level up so they have a place to stand in the water and splash around without being stuck in five or six inches of water. That's very interesting, never knew that. And now, so I'm gonna ask you a question. So I have a woodpecker who seems to think that he can pack my house. Sure. What, what is a way to distract? <laughs> I want him in the garden. 
Okay. First of all, um, without knowing anything about your house, typically the woodpeckers do this very early in the morning, which makes it all the more annoying because they're there at five o'clock in the morning. Um, they do it for a relatively short period of time in the spring. And the noise they make is not at all random. It's a very staccato. It's a mating call. They're not looking for food. They're not think you don't, you shouldn't think there are insects in the wood in your house. What the birds in nature are looking for is a big dead hollow tree that they can bang on that will echo throughout the neighborhood to attract a mate. Well, with a brain the size of a pebble, they fly down the street and see your house and say, ha, ah, dead tree. And so they will go up on the fascia board of your house and start wailing away until they find a mate. And then they will stop doing it. Okay. And they'll come back again in the they'll come back again in the fall. Now they are looking for food because they think there are insects in your house. Most of the time, it starts with the cooler weather. And it's because we start doing things like turning on the heat and using more hot water. And the birds sense the vibration of that hot water moving through the pipes. To them, what do they know from hot water? They, the vibration, there's insects eating the wood. And so they will now come to your house. But that's a much more random sound there, you know, peck, 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 peck. Yeah. And they're early in the spring. Oh, very interesting. What so can you do to stop it? You can, you can hang something that glitters. Um, mylar tape works well. Um, the back of a CD, hang it on some fishing line so that the wind from their wings as they come to land will cause it to move and the, re the sunlight reflected off it will startle them and keep them from feeling comfortable on the side of your house. Oh, wow. Didn't know that. So now other than that, are there any other birds that we wouldn't want to attract to our garden? Yeah, sure. We don't want the grackles, the big blackbirds that have a kind of an iridescent blue head. Um, they're obnoxious. They, they have no idea what it means to share. They want it all. They want to eat everything there is and then come back for more. Um, and that means the smaller songbirds and the more colorful birds that we want to see don't have a chance to get to the feeder. So what do we do? Well, for a period of time, the easiest thing to do is switch the bird seed that you're using. Use safflower. Safflower is a seed that the blackbirds don't like. And so if you fill your feeder with safflower, don't mix it with anything else. Just put safflower in. It will tend to, to, to move the blackbirds on their way. Um, if you've been using another type of seed and you switch to safflower, for about the first week, you're going to find a lot of safflower on the ground underneath the feeder because that blackbird will continue to come and throw out the seed it doesn't like looking for what it thinks was in there before and uh, until they get used to the fact that that's all that is in that feeder um, they'll keep coming back once they realize nothing here that i like they'll go away and leave it alone wow but while we're on that subject of different types of seed let's go back to the squirrel issue okay. how do i keep squirrels away from my feeder a couple things one you can get a feeder that's do not, I emphasize this, do not let anybody tell you that there exists a squirrel-proof bird feeder. Doesn't exist. Squirrel-resistant, yes. Squirrel-proof, no way. Squirrels are very clever and they're very persistent. They will continue to come back over and over and over again until they get what they want. But you can use a squirrel-resistant bird feeder. Some of them are spring-loaded so that the birds are light and they can eat what they want. The squirrels are heavy. When they come on the feeder, it shuts down so they can't get any seed out of it. You can put a cage around a feeder so that the birds, the small birds can fly right inside the cage, but the squirrels can't get in so they can't get to the seed. Um, and then the last resort is you can use seed treated with hot pepper, typically cayenne pepper. Um, and the the birds have no sense of heat. They don't have the glands necessary to feel the heat. But the squirrels are mammals, and they do, and it irritates them. And so they don't continue to come back over and over and over again. Except for one. You'll find one squirrel who says, the hotter the better. 
and he'll keep coming back over and over again. And there's just not much you can do about that. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've heard all kinds of stories. People who have way too much time on their hands will sit out in a chair across from their bird feeder and you'll always hear people threatening, I'm going to get a BB gun, I'm going to get a pellet pistol. <laughs> I, I don't recommend it. Not that there's any love lost between me and squirrels that raid your bird feeder. But first of all, it's not as easy to hit them as you think it might be. And second of all, sit out in your yard with a BB gun and you're going to get complaints from your neighbors. And you're not enjoying your garden. My advice is to get a, a water pistol, a, a super soaker, one of these long range water pistols, and then add something to the water like vinegar. That what you First of all, it's easy to hit the squirrel because you can follow the water stream until it lands where you want it to. Second of all, the, something like vinegar will leave an imprint on the animal so they won't come back. Yeah. If you just use water, they'll go away for 10 or 15 minutes and then they'll come right back. If you put something that's not harmful, but will get their attention, you can convince them this is not a place where they want to be. Well, you've given us so much information. Um, I think our time's almost up. So I would love to thank you for, um, for everything you've given us. Um, if we have any questions, hopefully we can get back to you. Um, anybody has questions, you, you, the library can call me back and we can do more of this type of thing. Um, you can call me. I'm in the store uh, seven, usually seven days a week. Um, you can call the, the Wild Birds Unlimited store on Ledge Road here in Darien. And I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about what their issues and problems are and see if we can find solutions. Well, thank it's you. Very hobby. It's an awful lot of fun. Look, can I just... Two seconds to add one more thing. We, you started out by talking about gardens. Now, I noticed from your accent that, that you're English, so or, or that type of an accent. And, and you refer to garden in a different way than we do here in the States. Typically, we think of the lawn as the area around our house, the garden, the place where we grow flowers or vegetables. Uh, for serious gardeners who grow a vegetable garden or a flower garden, my advice to you is at the end of the growing season, don't go in and clear that garden out completely. If you're going to clear, cut away the dead stuff, put it in a pile somewhere in the corner of the garden, at least until the next spring. The birds will use it as a place to hide from predators, and they will use the material. Even though the flowers are gone, there's still lots of seed there that they can eat, and they will use the material to, to take pull pieces off to make their nests in the spring. So I know true passionate gardeners want that garden to be pristine. I'm asking you take a section and allow the birds to have some habitat um, and, and then clean it up when you're ready to make your new plantings. That is a fantastic tip. I will absolutely be following your advice. <laughs> so thank you, Joe. We'll speak to you soon and have a great day. Thank you so much. My pleasure. You too. Enjoy the rest of the day.